You know, so when we talk about cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency actually puts the power back into the hands of the people mm. as far as as far as establishing intrinsic value in goods and services. OK. Mm. What's happening, y'all? This is Mike D with Black Fathers Now, where we're bringing the village to the brothers. Every couple of weeks, you can look forward to a quick inspirational message or a thought-provoking guest with knowledge and wisdom all geared towards helping you be the best father that you can be. We're bringing the village to you. Now it's your turn to do something with what you learn. All right, y'all. Let's go. What's going on, fellas? This is Mike D with Black Fathers Now. And dig this, man. I got a brother on the line today that, um, you know, it, he's in this industry that's like the hottest thing going, uh, cryptocurrency. And even if you're not into cryptocurrency, you've heard that term and you might know what it's about. You might not know. But this brother here is going to hip you to what's popping in cryptocurrency. He has a lot going on. But uh, he's also a deep brother that has a story. And um, first and foremost, I got to introduce him. I got my man Chris Cole. And uh, Chris is my frat brother, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated in the building. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Chris and I go way back, man. You know, he's from Augusta, Georgia. We actually went to high school together, Westside High School uh, in Augusta, Georgia. So I've known Chris for a long, long time. But he's an entrepreneur, he's a financial investor, a cryptocurrency expert, a world traveler. If you follow him on social media, you always see him posting pics from some exotic location somewhere. But most importantly, man, his brother's a father. And um, so it was really cool to have him to come on and really talk about his experience and talk about investing and talk about how all this stuff ties back to fatherhood. So, fellas, and I know some ladies are listening too, but fellas, let's welcome my man Chris Cole to the building. Chris, what's up, doc? What's up, man? I'm I'm glad you got me on, man. My pleasure to be here. Look forward to uh, you know spending these these next sixty minutes with you talking about whatever and, and uh, giving the people what they want. That's what it is, man. That's what it is. Giving the people what they want. And so before we get into what they want, man, let them hear a little bit about you, man. Like talk talk to us a little bit about your background, man. Your story. Like what what led you to get to this point of you know, trading and investing and just talk about you, man. Talk about a little bit about your background, man. Man, you know, um, you know, you're from Augusta, Georgia, and, and uh, really the, the outlook for young black men is not one that is promising, so to speak. Um, you know, so my background was a little a little colored, um, having been in the street, selling drugs, different things of that nature, just because the opportunity um, wasn't necessarily there and more importantly um just being a product of my environment um you know in which i was birthed into and what kind of led me into trading was i always was a big reader i always was in the numbers um i always did well academically um but my pops used to have a lot of books sitting around the house about trading and options and stocks and different things of that nature so i used to pick them up and read them and i used to read and hear about all these stories of these guys making these millions of dollars on uh wall street just by predicting price movements mm. and knowing where um you know this market was going to go and that market was going to go so i just kind of dived into the subject matter and um over the years one thing led to another and um you know i got to a couple of transitional points in my life you know when it was time for me to make a decision like man you know Am I going to stay in the streets? Because we all know how that's going to end up. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be dead or, dead or in jail. You know, and I and I lost friends, um, you know, to the graveyard and as well as to the penitentiary. You know what I mean? And I knew it would just be a matter of time before uh, I would be there if I didn't do something different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so the trading aspect was still appealing to me as well because it was like, man, what can I do? Uh, where I can still take control over my time, do what I want to do, buy what I want to buy, live the lifestyle I want to live, and not have to worry about looking over my shoulder or the police, you know, mm -hmm. or some, I mean, whatever the case might be. And, uh, you know, for me, the answer was trading, you know, and entering into the speculation market. Um, not saying it was an easy transition, uh -huh. you know. I, I, I dedicated, you know, pretty much the next two years of my life not going out, not spending extra money, not 
dating, not being in a relationship, you know what I mean? And even spent four months of that time um, in Atlanta being homeless, mm. you know, and um, my pride wouldn't let me go back to Augusta, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So I was working at uh, Crunch Fitness in Buckhead. Okay. Um, and I would train from five to 12 and then take a break from 12 to four. And then I was, you know, I work out from four to five and then I train again from like five to midnight, mm -hmm. you know, but it was an upscale gym, mm -hmm. um, in, in Buckhead, Atlanta. So I was showering there and, you know, I was really like, <clears throat> you know, getting my mind, body and shape for, you know, what was the lie ahead. And it was a four month period, you know, it took me about four months before I can get on my feet, get my own spot. Um, or whatnot, and everything else kind of been history, man. March will be 10 years wow. um, that I've been trading um, the markets full-time. And to be honest, this last six months has just been astronomical. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We all heard about, you know, it takes 10 years to uh, achieve overnight success. That's right. You know That's what I mean? Right. So 10,000 hours, right? Yeah, so, you know, I find it... Um, you know, I find it ironic that March actually March ten, you know, ten years to, to date since I, um, I've been doing this full time. Mm. You know, you know, it's interesting, man. Like um, hearing that, it's like first off, I learned something new about your, yourself and your journey or whatever that was powerful. But then it was just like I also tie that back into you know, yes, you grow up in you know from the streets and do different things. But then it's like you're a complex individual because it's like. You have the brother who's in the streets, but yet there are books around, right? Right. You're, you know, you, you got the game going on, but yet, you know, there's financial exposure and financial literacy and these things kind of circulating around you about opportunities outside man, of Man, man, I was just having a conversation with somebody the other day, and I was telling them my, you know, and I sold drugs all the way up until the moment that I, um, graduated from college and I ended up pledging Omega mm -hmm. um, the last semester of my senior year thanks mm -hmm. to my uh, advisor who happened to be my middle school football and basketball coach. Mm -hmm. But I was just telling somebody the other day, I was telling them a story and I was like, man, uh, you know, I remember a time when the narcs came to um, the trap house. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. sitting, I'm sitting in a trap house selling crack but i'm studying for a biological psychology wow test. <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> wow you know and it was just you know it, it was a state of confusion and shock for them when they came into the house you know what i mean like what was going on you know mm -hmm. but not to be um you, you know but to be honest i always knew that i was different from a very young age you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying i i never really fit into any um class category or you know whatever and i could relate and deal with all types of people from all different walks of life mm. you know what I mean? mm. and, and i, I okay. and i never had and i never had a problem you know being an individual either you know mm. what i'm saying like I, I never was the type to be persuaded by oh what a group doing this so i'm gonna do it you know what i mean so mm -hmm. everything that everything that i decided to do whether it was right or wrong it was I was totally committed to it. You mm. know what I mean? I didn't need an influence to say, yeah, man, let's go do this or, you know, let's go sell drugs or even on the flip side, let's go work out. Let's go put the time in to get better at golf, basketball, mm. whatever the case might be. Every time I made a decision, like, I was 100% committed to it no matter what was going on around me. You know what I mean? 100% mm, committed. You know, and it's interesting, you know, you're, you're the kind of brother that marches to the beat of your own drum. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and what's interesting about that is, you know, some, another thing, and you mentioned something there in kind of in passing, another thing that I remember about you growing up, you know, you're a couple years younger than me. I think you're along with Daniel and David, my brothers. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Me and Daniel you graduated, graduated together. Okay, yeah. So you're along with my, my two younger brothers or whatever. And what's interesting is I remember you playing golf. And right. yes, we all grew up kind of in the Tiger Woods era in the 90s, but golf was still something that a lot of brothers didn't do. Right. Right. And so it's just like you mentioned that 
but then you are also a brother who played golf. So that's what I'm saying. Right. Like, and I want the brothers to hear this, man, because a lot of times we also we always get um, kind of pigeonholed into one characteristic or one aspect of ourselves. But I love to talk to folks who have kind of like a nonlinear background, meaning they go from different things. They have all these things kind of mishmashed up to formulate who they are. And so, again, a brother who's a good student, who played golf, who played sports, who, you know, came from a good place, but yet still kind of ended up in the trap. But yet he's college educated, you know, but then in the midst of all of that, financial literacy was always kind of in the background and books were always surrounding him. This complexity helps to develop a person, but each one of those aspects are components of you, but you're not totally defined by any one of those specific aspects. Right, right. And, you know, uh, anybody who knows about, um, you know, the neighborhood in which I grew up in, you know, it's a it's a very peculiar place, to say the least. You know what I mean? We got a we got a poor African-American community that's adjacent to the Augusta National Augusta Country Club Mm -hmm. um, and surrounded by the old money of Augusta. That's right. You know what I mean? So the men in the neighborhood. They were either caddies at the Augusta National or the Augusta Country Club, mm-hmm. and the, and the women like my grandma, my my great aunt, they um went and raised the white folks' kids, went and cleaned their houses, houses and, and and different things, cook for them, different mm. things of that nature. You know what I'm saying? And all of us, you know, we came back to our hood at the end of the day. You know what I mean? So as a kid, like. Golf was always around, you know what I mean? It was always golf balls and golf clubs that, you know, we'd hit around, smack around. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as a kid, we used to jump the gate um, or go down Ray's Creek and end up on Augusta National and, you know, hit balls over there and, you know, until we got ran off and different things of that (laughs) nature. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh But it was one of those situations where, for me, um, just seeing that little white golf ball fly through the air just took me away from everything that I was dealing with um, mm. at home or everything that I was dealing with and seeing on a daily basis as a young kid. You know what I mean? So for me, I tell people I kind of got good at the game by accident because it was my place of peace. And even to this day, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's my place of peace. You know what I'm saying? That's where I, where I commune with God and where I'm more in tune with, um, you know, who I am on a mental and spiritual level. You know what I mean? Mm. Brother, that's deep, man. Complexity. But it's a good thing because that complexity has led you to the place that you are today, but also to the to the to the person and to the man that you are today. And so right. I guess kind of jumping back into the whole concept of like, uh, you know, like trading and finance and all of that. Like, talk to us a little bit about some of the, you know, the areas that you've jumped into when it comes. Even you can go into entrepreneurship too if you want to talk about that. But like some of the areas or some of the the assets that you kind of traded over the years, and you know, some of the things and the lessons learned um, in some of those various, you know, forms of trading. Um, so I started out trading stock options okay. um, because my my pops used to have a lot of books on trading stock options. So that was kind of like my first introduction into the game. You know what I mean? And then I start um, looking into stocks themselves. And then I found the futures market uh, maybe two or three years into the game. And uh, I kind of been stuck there ever since. You know what I mean? I started out trading, um, you know, what most people trade, the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 and the Dow Jones futures and different things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when my knowledge base began to expand, not only just from a financial um, standpoint, but just an a, a economic and systematic standpoint of just mm. how everything is tied in and how things are worked, I started to trade bond futures. So now, mm. over the past four or five years, it's been exclusively 30-year bonds and 10-year treasury notes. Mm -hmm. Because the fact of the matter is, it's a method to the madness. It's a Mm -hmm. method to the monetary system in which our country is is ran off of. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. uh, in the bonds and the notes, you know, which essentially represents uh, interest rates and debt in the country, they can only fluctuate so far back and forth before, um, you know, they cause some type of global economic catastrophe Mm. you know what i'm saying um um, so you know i I like to call it organized chaos that's right you know what i mean 
Mm-hmm. Um, Controlled mayhem. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, the, the bonds and the notes, futures contracts are something that um, I, I've developed a couple of different systems for that has allowed me to consistently be able to put food on the table and provide for the family, as well as, you know, the opportunity to educate others and to build different relationships and, and network along the way as well. Mm. Now, and and as far as the cryptocurrency, um, you know, just like everybody else, I was kind of skeptical of it, but I've been mm-hmm. dealing with it for the last, um, you know, two years and really dived into it super heavy, um, you know, over the last eight to 12 months, you know what I mean? Um, again, going back to my understanding of how money works, how our system mm-hmm. is set up, you know what I'm saying? Consumerism, uh, capitalism, you know what I mean? And understanding how this, uh, technology could be benefit. Well, it, well, it is, it's going to be beneficial for us, um, you know, as a people, you know what I mean? As far as carrying out our transactions on a day to day basis. Mm. Dude, you know, you said something there that um, I think a lot of people might overlook, but you talked about a system, right? Right. Like, um, you know, you learned, you know, trading, and it took you years to get to a point in which things were pretty much proficient. But something that you pointed out there, and I don't know if everybody's going to pull this out, but you mentioned once I developed a system. Once right. I developed a method, but then after I developed a system and a method, I then understood that there's a whole method and a system to the whole monetary system that we live in, the monetary policy. And so I think sometimes, you know, we, a lot of guys, I mean, ladies too, but a lot of guys, a lot of brothers, man, we look and think people swing from the hip, right? We think right. that folks just by happenstance, this happened, or this was like I'm gambling and it's, it's a little bit of luck. Like, no, right. there's a system behind everything. There is right. a stra- whether it appears to be a strategy or not. You know, it's kind of like fashion, right? Like, sometimes they have people who wear, like, T-shirt and their hair looks like it's all over the place and all of that. But you don't right. realize they had a stylist to come up with a look to make it look like they just didn't care and they just jumped out of bed, right? Right, right, there, right. <laughs> there's a system behind it all. So you highlight the fact that there was a system or there's a method to the madness when it comes to monetary policy and everything. But what's interesting is having that background and then diving into crypto gives you a totally different perspective. And I I assume an advantage over a lot of people who were not financial players in the, in the market and really understanding the markets, but then they just jumped into crypto with no backstory in finance. Right. Just, just from a gambling, you know, to kind of sum it up, like when we, when we talk about, our money in a U.S. dollar, and you know, because that's been the biggest thing. Oh, crypto isn't backed by anything, just like the dollar isn't backed by anything. Mm-hmm. Well, the fact that the matter, and, and you know, you hear the word decentralization circling mm-hmm. around cryptocurrency, and it got, you know, it carries a negative connotation with it. Um, but the fact that the matter is <clears throat> that our society, our world, our dollar is a debt instrument, mm-hmm. and the fact of the matter is that we can't even deposit or withdraw money from the bank if debt didn't exist somewhere. Wow. You know what I mean? So our world, the world that we live in, the reality, you know, our society, whatever you want to, you know, however you want to categorize it, is built around the people being in debt. And that is and that is the purpose of um of banking institutions. That's the purpose of a a centralized Federal Reserve, you know what I mean? Because they can manipulate, um, duplicate, and debase the currency in favor of them and to continue to carry out their agenda and operation as it pertains to money. You know, so when we talk about cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency actually puts the power back into the hands of the people Mm. as as, as far as establishing intrinsic value in goods and services okay Hmm. because when we talk about the purpose of something being backed by something the only reason fdr seized all the gold in 1933 and debased the currency devalued the currency you know Hmm. and and then um you know reagan did it again with the geneva convention you know with the u.s dollars the world currency blase blase whatever 
It's only two reasons that a currency needs to be backed by anything. And the two reasons are to prevent manipulation and to prevent duplication. Mm. Okay. So when we talk about cryptocurrency and the blockchain technology, the blockchain technology, there is no bubble. There is no need for it to be backed by anything because the integrated technology that the blockchain carries along with it prevents cryptocurrency from being duplicated and or manipulated. Mm. By any so, one entity. By any by yeah, or by anybody. So when we so when we say we got twenty one million Bitcoin, it's twenty one million Bitcoin. You know, we can't Bitcoin can't fall off and then all of a sudden we say, Okay, well we're gonna print twenty one million more Bitcoin. Oh, you know what I mean? Gotcha. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about fiat currencies and different things of that nature, when governments get into bonds or, or, or they wanna debase a currency, all they do is print more dollar bills. Wow. They put more money into circulation. Huh, and so that is protected because of the blockchain with cryptocurrency. Right. You can't mani- you can't manipulate you can't manipulate the cur- currency and you can't duplicate the currency. You know, if the Federal Reserve tries to print, you know, if they get in a in a bind and they say, "Okay, well we're going to print, you know, a billion more dollars." Okay. You know, what is that what is that based off of? You know what I mean? What is what is it outside running through, you know, outside of running paper through a printer? And turning them into hundred dollar bills, you know what I mean. There's nothing backing it. It's nothing. It's nothing backing it, and it's it's pure manipulation and duplication of a currency. Mm. And and you said something that was wild to me, man. And it's like I never thought about it this way. Like I I have a degree in economics, and you know you know invest a little bit and do this and do that. But I had never thought about it this way until the way that you eloquently put it. Our dollar is a debt instrument. And our, right. our world is built around people being in debt. Like, it's crazy because that is so true. When you step back and you look at it, you know, how do they measure the, you know, the strength of an economy? You know, it's about. Well, so, well so, so they trick us into believing that, you know, our money is worth some. But the fact of the matter is what most people don't know is that all of us who are United States citizens, we were born with two birth certificates. A life certificate of birth and another birth certificate, which is a loan form, which is actually a, a bond certificate that backs us as a people as instruments. This is how our country is measured. This is how whoa, our. Whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Come, come back, come back. So whenever U.S. citizens are born with two birth certificates, an actual right. birth certificate, but then there's in essence like a, a debt instrument against. The yeah, you got you got a birth you got a birth you got another birth certificate out there with Michael Dorsey on there with a barcode and if you looked up that number and barcode on it if you were to go get that birth certificate it has a dollar amount attached to it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and so for that purpose like what is the the specific purpose of there being a dollar amount attached to my individual or, or the fact, or the fact that it matter, the us, the people, we mm-hmm. we're the one, we're the one who backed the United States government and, and economy, mm-hmm. not our, not our dollars because our dollars ain't worth nothing. That's right. Oh. It's the people, you know. So every time a child is born, um, you know, we got another, um, you know, we got another bond certificate on the ledger. What? Dude, you uh, like you know you blowing folks' mind. I know you blowing my mind, but <laughs> wow! So whenever someone is born in America, another bond certificate is created in America. Now I got a question. So does that ha- does that bond certificate get erased at death? One, but then two. What about people who like uh, who immigrate to the United States and aren't born here? Once they become official citizens, is there then a, a bond certificate created for them, or is that uh, kind of off in you know space somewhere? Well, I, well, I'm sure there is some type of um, some type of similar instrument put in place. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it works with uh, immigration, but mm-hmm. understanding the system and how it works, there is no person accounted for that they're not gonna uh leverage as 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 money on a global economic scale Mm. so that's why that's why that's why this whole immigration and illegal alien thing is such a big deal it's not about the protection of 
uh, of the people. It's about not being able to. Um, <laughs> a, it, it's not about being. A, it's, wow. it's about not being able to account uh, for these people and being able to, to use them as leverage on our ledger. You know, as a you know, on a global economic scale. Wow, <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm gonna tell you. You're you're um you, you just flip this thing on its side completely <laughs> because that that is an area or that is an era like a, a segment of the argument that across because I, I like to listen to you know political talk on both sides of the aisle right but so that you can hear right. all perspectives I read a lot of different things from various authors and you know have in depth conversations with people from various backgrounds so that you kind of see things from a lot of different angles right. Because right. again, that helps you to formulate an educated opinion on, you know, what's going on, but then an understanding of all the conversations I've had, of everything that I've read, of all the things that I've researched, the podcasts I've listened to, the YouTube videos I've watched, everything. I have never heard that specific argument being made about immigration. All right. Why? Oh, my gosh. You, you, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, nothing is, you know, as it appears to be. That's you know right. what I mean? Right. Um, and, and you got to understand that the media job is to build a narrative around what's actually going on in, in a way that the people can relate or be okay with. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, so we definitely, you know, it's just like everything else. We definitely have to be mindful of the things that we take in, you know, that we take in, the, the, uh, who we get our information from, you know, the things that we feed our mind and spirits on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, because I, I, I tell people all the time in conversations, like, you know, they talk about slavery and like, oh, if I was, a, you know, born back in slavery, I'd do this or do that. And I say, well, if you were born into slavery, did you ever really know that you were a slave? That's right. That's right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's the same way on you know that we live in a day. We're born into a system, so we don't, and we're educated to operate within that system. So we don't really know any better if we don't go outside and seek education or seek the truth for our ourselves. You know what I'm saying? And mm. self and self educate. Mm. Dude, I'm going to tell you, and you mentioned self-education, dude. I'll tell you, you know, I finished college in 2002, and like I said, right. I got a degree in economics from Georgia Tech and all of that. But I've learned more in my post-college or post-schooling studies because those were all self-directed. Those were all things that I was personally interested in, and those are all things that I retained, right? Right. Because if you think about everything from degrees and high school or whatever, you could ask me a question now about some – economic theory of this and whatever of that honestly i probably cannot regurgitate it to you being straight right. old, because that was all from school and that was something that was forced upon me everything that i've learned since then has been self-directed so therefore i've had an interest in it so therefore i can spit off quotes and things that i've read in the hundreds of books that i've read since then that um that have helped to build and mold my thought process and who i am so you mentioned that self taught or self-directed learning is so important fellas listen to that self-directed learning you have to find things and invest in read and consume content you don't, you don't even have to read anymore necessarily because you can consume things via audio like this podcast you can go to youtube channels i mean there's so many different things that you can do to consume content but be careful be mindful of what you consume because all those things help to influence your thought processes and your thought process influences your actions and so and chris to me is a prime example of that i mean he had various experiences but his thought process is what's influencing his action. So he jumped into finance based on the things that he was exposed to, which influenced his thought process, right? What fed his spirit, which fed his mind, that led him into finance. And from there, you know, over this last year and a half or so, he's really, you know, dove into cryptocurrency. And, uh, and, and now he's considered an expert in cryptocurrency. And he gave a lot of background here that was so powerful in regards to understanding the true value of cryptocurrency. And, and I'll tell you, just to be completely transparent, I'm not a skeptic of the blockchain. I think that is something that's, you know, 100 percent going to flip things on its side. And I even had a conversation yesterday with a good friend of mine, and we were talking about just the whole international market, like, when we, think, right. when we think about ourselves here, you know, we think about the dollar, but you gave us obviously some different things to think about when it comes to the dollar and currency, you know, in our particular country. But when you travel internationally and you see how, you know, in certain countries, a lot of people don't fool with the banks. 
or they use like uh, you know person to person transfers using like Mpesa or some other um, you know technology to transfer funds from person to person directly as opposed to going through a bank to make the transfer. You start to see the potential benefit of a cryptocurrency and how that can completely flip things on its side, and it's doing that already. But how going forward it could be even more impactful. Well, see, th- and you and you brought up something very important there, uh, where you say you go internationally. I've been fortunate enough to travel um, to various countries and notice how they don't use the banking system, though, that way that we use the banking system. Mm-hmm. Now, if we take it back a little further and we talk about cell phones, mm-hmm. yep. cell cell phones everywhere. You know, I, I talk to my friends down in Jamaica, Belize, mm-hmm. wherever, via WhatsApp, cell phone. Everybody got cell phones. Right. Now, think about those countries before cell phones, they didn't have landline telephones. Some of those landline networks and companies, they didn't want to go there and establish landline networks for these companies or these, you know, what, what they like to call third world countries. And I like to call them countries that, you know, they don't conform to, you know, Western our standards That's right. to the to the Western standards. And, and you know, none, none third world about them at all. Nothing. Um, but what did those third world countries do? They skipped the landline era of communication right. and went directly to cell phones. That's right. You know what I mean? And guess what? These and everybody who was a part of this cell phone at the beginning of um, the launch of cell phone technology, guess what? They made a, a ton of money, hand over fist. Yeah. Dude. So, Ooh, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so when so when we look at cryptocurrency and monetary systems, these same countries. Um, and I say all this to say because people are like, man, I think I'm in too late because they see the Bitcoin explosion. Like, this is still just the beginning. Yes. What's, what we're going to see in 2018 is the same thing that we've seen with phones, mm-hmm. okay? These countries, these what they like to call third world countries, are going to skip general um, banking brick and mortar systems and go straight to cryptocurrency. Mm. And they're going to become their own banks because the use of cryptocurrency is that I'm, I'm my own bank. You know what I mean? And guess what? They're going to be able to carry out their banking transactions and their business transactions right from the cell phones that they already have. Mm. So now they don't have to deal. You know, it's going to be the exact same process, but 10, 20, maybe 50 times larger than that of the cell phone boom. You know, it's crazy you say that, man. Like uh, when my wife and I, summer 2016, went to Tanzania. And it's right. crazy when you, I mean, you're in the middle of like a major metropolis like Dar es Salaam or you're walking around Zanzibar, you know, with Wi-Fi everywhere and hotels and all that stuff. You know, you see folks walking around with their cell phones. You peek over their shoulder. They're update, updating their Facebook account. They're transferring money. All this kind of stuff, like stuff that you don't think about. This is in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. When we got away from the major city and we were out in the rural areas headed towards a safari, we were out in the rural areas and rural communities and all. Everywhere you look, you see an advertisement for Vodafone or um, Airtel, which are basically yeah. the major um, you carriers. Know, the major you go to the Caribbean's Digicel. Digicel, yep. You know, yeah. And you so, know, I, I went to Haiti and... It was kids who necessarily, they might not have food, but they had three cell phones. That's, it's crazy. That's what I'm <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and so you, you stop and you think. So to that point, we get stuck in our bubble and we just look around and right. see what the guy to my left and right are doing. But we don't pan back. Yes, the United States is a leader in a lot of different things around the world. But the United States, it, I think, re- represents only 5% of the world's population. And so when you step back and pan out from that and start looking at it, you're like, man, this thing is a whole lot bigger than myself. And so to your point, the whole concept of cryptocurrency or getting involved in cryptocurrency allows you to be a player in not just the 5% people thing. It allows you to be a player in regards to the full 7.7 billion folks around the world and what they're doing and how they transact and how they communicate. So that's so talk, so you know since we're already into the crypto thing, man, Talk about what you have going on with cryptocurrency, and um, but then also, you know, talk a little bit about like how are people making money with cryptocurrency? Like, I mean, you know, is it something in which you're, you know, you're just buying some currency and holding it? Is it something where people are trading it? it or, and then we also hear that they're like a thousand different types of cryptocurrency, and then I hear things like mining and 
all that stuff. Man, give us a little rundown as to what you got going on with crypto, but then, you know, how people are actually making money and how you can become a player in the crypto world. Man, I, I'm doing it all all across the board. I got, um, I'm, I'm doing buy and hold. Um, I'm, I'm what you call an Ethereum evangelist. Ethereum is uh, responsible for the smart contracts um, and different things of that nature. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer in uh, the Ethereum coin. So, you know, all the money that I'm making, what you call altcoins, mm-hmm. um, the alternative coins that are built off of those, you know, similar blockchain technologies as the big three, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin, uh, I take my profit, profits from there and just store them in Ethereum. Um, I'm in the mining. So mining is the actual, um, in short, it verifies the transactions. If you and I were going to carry out a transaction, um, the mining aspects verifies the transactions from my wallet to your wallet. And as a result, um, the miner is rewarded, uh, with a portion of that coin. Oh, wow. Um, and so I mine, um, I got a, a mining operation. I got a few big investment mining operations that I'm working on. Um, with some private investors. I got some mining machines in my home. And essentially, they're printing presses, man. You know, you plug them into the wall, and they mine coins 24-7, 365. I was away. just got back from Miami. I was down there for three or four days. I could monitor everything that it was doing right there from my cell phone. Uh, You know, and (laughs) it's just that. It's a printing press. It's actually making more coins, you know. So I'm participating in the actual um, price fluctuations of the coin as well as my ability to produce more coins um, through the process of, of, of mining. Wow. Wow. So right. And, and so with the altcoins, so with all the, the, the thousand different coins or whatever, you, you're actively like trading with those and making a profit off of that, but then you're taking the profit and putting it into Ethereum, which is the, the, the major coin – that you're yeah, it's yeah, it's my it's it's my safe haven, you know. And to be honest, man, I don't I don't even have any money in my savings account anymore. Like my crypto really? my cryptocurrency uh, wallets are my savings account because savings accounts not making any money. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of people, you know, they get scared because oh, Bitcoin it it dropped and you know it, it you know these wild price swing movements or whatever the case might be the fact of the matter is the only time that you can truly make money is doing times of high volatility mm. so the fact that the cryptocurrency market is so volatile it puts you in a position um to make a large amount of money in a very short period of time mm-hmm. with 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 really uh small downside risk um if you know how to go about approaching it. Now we've been tricked into this narrative of slow and steady, mm-hmm. um, you know, type of investments and IRAs and 401ks and all of that stuff. Well, the fact of the matter is wall street, these banking institutions and these financial, um, institutions, they make money by possessing your money for a long period of time and mm-hmm. charging, charging fees on the money. So the longer I can continue to contribute to to um, this fund and the longer I can continue to hold your money, I can continue to charge you more fees and make money. Mm. The fact that, you know, why they haven't jumped on a plot of the cryptocurrency is the fact that the cryptocurrency doesn't have a uh, correlating instrument or a diverging instrument, meaning that if Bitcoin goes up, X, Y, and Z goes down. You know what I mean? Wow. So, so they're you, independent. They're all 100% yeah, they're, yeah, they're one hundred percent independent. So you don't need to invest with a, a Merrill Lynch or a four hundred one k or IRA or whatever the case might be in order to make money. You know, when you think about a financial advisor, they always tell you to invest in stocks and bonds. Let's mm-hmm. create a, a balanced portfolio. You know, they use the narrative. Let's create a balanced portfolio. Of stocks and bonds. Well, the fact of the matter is, think about why would they want you to invest in stocks and bonds? That's right. Because, yeah, the returns are, I guess you could say, consistent across the board, but do they keep up with inflation? Mm. Do they keep up inflation after they, you you know, you're paying your, your fees? You know what I mean? Um, but back to my point, they want you to balance it with stocks and bonds because historically, as stocks goes up, bonds go down. Mm-hmm. 
if bonds go down, stocks go up. So we have a hedging instrument between stocks and bonds. So you're never going to make too much and you're never going to lose too much. Mm. You know what I mean? And because it's quote unquote seems to be safe, I'm, you know, Mike Dorsey, I'm going to continue to contribute a thousand dollars a month to my 401k or my IRA because I ain't made a whole lot of money, but I ain't lost a whole lot of money either. Mm. You know, um, and we're, and with cryptocurrency is not, um, that way. So, um, it's just a matter of time before wall street has to jump on board due to these, um, the bubble that truly exists in the stock market. Um, even if it's just a two and a half to 5% allocation, you're going to start seeing, um, you know, financial advisors and banking institutions come up with a ETF. You know, they just, they just launched Bitcoin futures in December 10th. Um, and the fact that they even, that the futures product was the first thing that they introduced. And historically like futures are used as a hedging instrument. Mm. You know what I mean? So the fact, you know, so I suspect sometime during this year, we'll see a fund start to offer a Bitcoin ETF. You know, you know what I mean? And say to your point, it's interesting because they have to figure out a way for the, the institutions have to figure out a way to monetize it. So therefore, they set up an ETF right. with futures contracts for, you know, cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. But then they can now, as opposed to us being self-educated and doing it ourselves, they can now charge us some kind of management fee to go Absolutely. and do what we can all individually do on our own now with a little bit of education. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Dude, I, now, I guess now the next question when it comes to that, though, is like for somebody who is currently like for me, like I said, I've been sitting on the sidelines. I'll be 100 percent with you. I've been sitting on the sidelines right. when it comes to crypto. I've been doing some research, having a lot of conversations about it. I opened a Coinbase account, but I ain't done nothing with it. Um how does someone or how would you recommend a brother listening? Because I'll assume there's probably a lot of brothers kind of like myself that are interested, but yet don't want to just throw this out there or whatever. Like, how, how would you suggest us jumping in and getting started on the, on the front end with crypto? Uh, um, well, the fact of the matter is Coinbase is definitely a good, a good start. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, throw 50 bucks in there. Okay. You know what I mean? Throw 100 bucks in there and just just watch it. Get familiar with it. And the thing, you know, the thing about it is once you start committing some capital to it, I don't care if it's a little bit of money, mm-hmm. you you know, 95% of us are going to start to take a little more interest into it. All of us are aware of it. All of us are semi-educated on us, on the, on the subject matter. But when we got a little bit of skin in the game, we start to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's right. And that's and as we start to die, as you start to dive into that subject matter and get familiar with it, then um, you know you'll start to get an understanding of how the inner workings of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency work. You'll start contributing more to it. Start reaching out to um, you know different educators, platforms. Like I'm doing a, a conference here in Atlanta, February third. I got six more cities that I'm gonna be doing after that. Um, I'm working with some guys from Major League Trading to put together some educational um, material and courses re- uh, revolving around cryptocurrency, as well as giving people uh, investment opportunities to take place in cryptocurrency mining. Um, you know, so it's going to be avenues that's going to start to to develop. Um, you know, that's you know, going to give you the opportunity just to kind of educate yourself, dive into the subject matter and move forward. But, mm. you know, everybody I talk to, I tell them, I'm like, look, I, I'm not I like I don't have to I'm not begging you for your money. I don't need you, you know, your investment or whatever case might be, even if you don't want to invest in me or pay attention to what it is that I have to say for whatever reason, like do your due diligence, do your research and get involved in some shape, form or, or fashion, because the fact of the matter is, the financial transition is taking place on a global scale as we speak. Mm. You know, and, and right now it's still less than 1% of the global population that are participants. What we're going to see in 2018 is even more astronomical growth because we're going to close that gap from awareness to participation. Mm. You know, we're going to start seeing more money get involved. We're going to start seeing Wall Street build a narrative, you know what I mean? And we're going to start seeing it more. Um, you know, adopted by 
our children. We talk about fatherhood. Look That's at right. the young folks. You know what I mean? Um, first time I heard, you know, heard about the spike or whatnot. My nephew, he a freshman in high school. You know, I, I go bounce ideas off him all the time. Little do he know it. Just to see what him and his friends talking about and what they, you know, you know what lane they in, how they thinking about different things. Because the fact of the matter is, what they adopt, you know, that's where we headed. That's right. That's right. You know, in the fact of the matter, like we already have, you know, Wall Street is already on pins and needles because we see the generation now not buying stocks, not mm-hmm. buying bonds, not investing in IRAs and 401ks, you know, but they're taking a, um, you know, they're taking a self-directed approach when it comes to money management. That's right. That's right. And you look at better things like Betterment and, you know, all these other little, was it Wealthfront, all these things that are kind of getting away from Yeah, you. like, you mean, I, I got friends, they send me all the time, you know, they get new jobs and they're like, man, which one should I invest in or whatever? And it's kind of hard for me to recommend them because, mm-hmm. recommend it because it's like, this is stuff that you can do yourself. Like, you're paying so much money and you're losing so much money along the way because, you're contributing to this 401k and IRA. And I know like, oh, some people listen to this like, oh, man, he may sound crazy. But the fact of the matter is like 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, ETS, different things of that nature with a little bit of time and self-education. These are things that you can do yourself and outperform anything your job could ever put together for you. Mm. Mm. That's man. Because you got to think about it. Why would your job want to help you make more money um, fast? <laughs> they don't want you because if they help if you make more money yeah. fast, then it's quicker that you're out there. Yeah, That's right. if you're if you're a good employee, we want you to contribute to this fund over the next twenty years, and you'll li- you'll live a decent life when we get through using up all the good years of your life. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> But but why would they put you in a portfolio or or a financial instrument that'll put you in a position to retire in the next three to four years? <laughs> like it just don't make no sense. Message, you know what I mean? Message, fellas. I hope you're listening. Step back. This, you know, we're talking cryptocurrency and we're talking about a brother Chris Cole and his story and his life. But I'll tell you, this is really about taking control of your life. Right. You know, taking control of the life that you've been blessed with so that you can then ultimately walk in your calling, walk in your purpose and do the things that, you know, God's placed inside of you to do in life. Help the people you're supposed to help be the example that you're supposed to be. That's what this is. When I'm thinking about the theme of this and what we're talking about, it's not just finance. It's not just trading. It's not just cryptocurrency. It's not just coming from the hood and doing this and doing that. It's about taking control of your situation and being the man that you're supposed to be. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Like money only, only money only solve financial problems. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And we talking about fatherhood and that's why I appreciate my daughter. I'm excited about my son getting here because we all were kids once, mm-hmm. you know, and as a kid, we wanted to be astronauts and firefighters mm-hmm. and doctors, lawyers, superheroes, you know what I mean? And somewhere along the way, along the way we start valuing the opinions of others more than we have valued the opinions of ourselves. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And we, and we fell into this conformity because this is what you're supposed to do. You know what I mean? Mm. And even when we talk about jobs and degrees and different things of that nature, like, and I'm not saying all, you know, I don't want people to get offended, but that's, that's, I, I look at those things as, as consolation prizes. You know, because when we talk about stress and being satisfied, the fact of the matter is like it's all about being able to control your time, being able to do what you want to do with your time, having the freedom and flexibility to live your life how you want to live it. Mm -hmm. To be, you know, to carry out your God given purpose the way God intended you to carry it out. I doubt God wanted, you know, put us here to work for a company for 30 years Mm -hmm. in the and neglect our children and put them in the school system and allow the school system to raise our children, raise our children and integrate and program them for the things that the public school system want them to to learn. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you can't sit up here and convince me that that was God purpose for our life. I don't care how many degrees or how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that you make. You know what I mean? Um, 
So our ability to control our time, had that freedom and flexibility to contribute and carry out our purpose as it as it pertains to building a, you know, completing our destiny and building our legacy along the way. Mm. You know what I mean? Fellas, look, he said something here. We were talking finance, we're talking cryptocurrency, we're talking life, but there's so much wisdom here. You know, when Chris just dropped, he said money only solves your financial issues, right? But money only solves your financial issues. But at the end of the day, there's still other things that have to be solved. And when we stop and we look about, look at our lives and committing ourselves to things that really don't matter. I had an episode a couple of week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the title of the episode was, you know, my commitment to decommitting from things in life that don't matter. Because we get caught up doing so much in life that really doesn't matter, that doesn't move the needle. And like Chris just mentioned, that's not necessarily your God-given destiny, right? We're doing so many things, and we're the hamster in the wheel just continuously churning. But in reality, is that our destiny in life? Is that what he's called us to do? And, and like Chris just mentioned, and I believe this too, I don't think it's our destiny to be a hamster in a wheel. I, do, right. I truly do not believe that. So how do we get ourselves in a position in which we can think clearly, that we can think freely? Like, you know, he mentioned that, you know, as a kid, you know, we valued our own opinions. We wanted to be astronauts. We wanted to be acrobats. We wanted to be all of that. But at certain points in our lives, when we got to a certain point in which we became so rational that we stopped dreaming, that we stopped, you know, thinking about the big picture and who it is we're called to be in life, and we started thinking about what's practical, what makes sense. And really what's practical and what makes sense is basically what have I seen somebody else do and how. Right. And that's what it is. It's not about me. It's about valuing what other people say. And, you know, I, I just, yeah. fellas, I, look, look, we can talk for hours and hours and hours about this. Chris, you, you, you mentioned something a minute ago about on February the 3rd you have a crypto conference in Atlanta and you have some other uh, crypto conferences, you know, popping up, I think seven cities or something. Uh, around the country. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about the uh, the, crypt, the upcoming crypto conference and um, and some of the other conferences and things that you have going on. Yeah, so um, actually today, the 29th, uh, I know it's going to be pre-recorded, but it's dropping on the 29th. I'll be on a Ricky, mm-hmm. Ricky Smiley morning show um, discussing some of these same things, cryptocurrency, uh, finances, whatever, blase, blase. February 3rd, I'm actually hosting um, a conference in Atlanta um, the ATL Crypto Summit, mm-hmm. which is going to discuss everything crypto from the basics all the way to crypto mining. I got people, different experts flying in. That's going to be contributing to it. Friday night, I'm going to do a kickoff party at the Intercontinental in uh, Buckhead, Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, That's February the sec- so February yeah, 2nd. February, you have the kickoff yeah, party. February 2nd kickoff party. The actual event is February the 3rd. Um, you can get the tickets on eventbrite.com, ATL Crypto Summit. Um, mm-hmm. Just look in the city of Atlanta. Um, and, man, yeah, we, gonna, we got six more cities um, that we're going to carry out this conference. Um, I got another conference that I'm speaking at in Tampa, March 28th and 29th. Mm-hmm. Um, just got out of a meeting with NBC, going to be doing a reality show um, surrounded around uh cryptocurrency um as well that'll be airing late april early may um so i got a lot of different things on the horizon man my thing is um, i want to get the message out to as many people as possible as many of us as possible um and really put us in a position to get ahead of of the curve and take advantage of um you know what's going on this transition you know what i mean and, and so, and what's the and what's the best way for folks to check in with you to follow? Like you mentioned, the uh, you know check in about the crypto summits, or, and if they're coming to a city near you, or to check in with the reality show or the stuff. Yeah, what's so you can follow you. Um, on in my Instagram is Chris Cole. I am. Um, and then it's also a um, website to be some contact information. You sit, submit your contact information, all that stuff, and that's going to be. Chris Cole, I am, dot com as well, and that'll have some links there to send you in different directions depending on what your interest is um, as well. Okay, so Chris Cole, I am on Instagram, and Chris Cole, I am, dot com are the ba- are the two best ways to communicate and connect with you. Yep. 
Okay, and so, fellas, that's going to be in the show notes. So definitely click the link in the show notes and visit ChrisColeIM.com or follow Chris Cole I Am on Instagram, and you can check in. Uh, and then also on Eventbrite, you know, search for the ATL Crypto Summit this upcoming Monday, Monday, February the 3rd right. in Atlanta, uh, and get your tickets for that, as well as there's a kickoff party on February the 2nd. So check out the uh, the Eventbrite for ATL Crypto Summit, and uh, but then also visit ChrisColeIM.com and follow Chris Cole I Am on Instagram. Um Bruh, is there anything else that you'd like to to share with the brothers, to share with the black fathers on um, you know, on the show, man? Anything else you want to leave us with, man? Man, my thing is just be a father to your children, man. You know, that's that that's all I can say. You know, um, you know, be the example, set the example. Um, you know, and everything that you do, keep your children and your family first. You know, that's your, that's your nucleus, that's your core, that's your support system. Um, you know, that's who you do it for, you know, and it's important that you, um, establish that foundation and, and build upon that legacy. You know what I mean? Give your children something that, you know, a pedestal in which they can step on and start, start building for the following generations after, after them. You know what I mean? Mm. Fellas, y'all have been blessed with some wisdom that is like, whew, y'all been blessed with some wisdom today, man. And so I got to thank my bruh, my dude, Chris Cole, for coming on, man. Yeah, sharing, no problem. Man, I appreciate you, man, you know, sharing his story and, you know, dropping his info on trading and finance and crypto, but more importantly, this wisdom on life. And uh, I hope you all take heed to this information and put it into practice, but then also check him out, ChrisColeIM.com, ChrisColeIM on Instagram, and, uh, and then also check out the ATL Crypto Summit, but then pay attention and follow him because he's got a crypto summit probably coming to a city near you in the very near future. So check in with him, but also let him know that you heard about him on Black Fathers Now and, um, and you really dug his story. So, fellas... As always, as always, definitely visit BlackFathersNow.com. Uh, follow Black Fathers Now on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, subscribe to Black Fathers Now. Share it with friends. Uh, leave a lot of comments. Just all that good stuff. And this episode has been brought to you by BlackFamilyApparel.com. Visit BlackFamilyApparel.com and grab some awesome apparel that celebrates the nuances of the black family. And fellas, until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll holler at you. Peace. Yo, fellas, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And always, always, always visit blackfathersnow.com as well as follow Black Fathers Now on virtually every social media platform you can think of. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere just follow us and uh and engage with us man look forward to hearing from you and uh i guess until next time i'll holler at you peace